Nurse, Soldier, Spy, The Story of Sarah Edmonds, a Civil War Hero, by John Hendricks. Defend our noble union, prove your patriotism and love of country. President Abraham Lincoln had just declared war on the southern states seceding from the Union, and the new army needed men. When Frank Thompson saw a poster requesting recruits, he decided he would be one of them. Except, Frank wasn't his real name. In fact, Frank wasn't a man. He was really Sarah Emma Edmonds. Sarah was only 19, but she had already been dressing as a man for three years. Originally, she had cut her brown wavy hair and put on pants to escape a marriage arranged by her parents. She had run away, crossing the border from Canada into the United States, trading a bridal gown for trousers, trading countries, without a single regret. Once she discovered the freedom of taking big strides unhindered by heavy skirts and the freedom to travel when and where she wanted, she couldn't put a dress back on. Now, as Frank Thompson, she joined the long line of men snaking around the Michigan courthouse, eager to give back to the country that had given her a new life. When it was her turn, she leaned over for the pen, ready to sign on the Union Army. Just a moment there, the, record, the recruiter said. Sarah froze. Could he tell she was a woman? How? She'd been fooling people for so long, she thought her disguise was perfect. Growing up on a farm, she'd learned to handle a gun and a horse. Even then, she'd put on her brother's homespun pants to hunt. So learning to walk, talk, eat, and gesture like a man had come so easy to her. By now, it was a habit. Yes? I know you love your country, the man said kindly, but you need to grow up a bit before you join the army. He looked at her peachy cheeks, free of any sign of whisker. We aren't taking any 16-year-olds. But, Sarah protested, both relieved and frustrated. By the time you're old enough, son, this war will be over. Now go on home. The recruiter took the pen and passed it to the unshaven farmer behind her. Sarah's ears burned red with flame. When the men left for basic training, the whole town of Flint, Michigan, saw them off. It was like a parade. Sarah cheered with everyone else, but she wanted desperately to be one of those going, not one of those staying behind and waving handkerchiefs in a teary goodbye. A month later, she got her chance. More men were needed, and this time the recruiter only glanced at Sarah. Another boy, he muttered, shaking his head. He'd already signed up a dozen gangly teenagers. This fresh-faced kid was, so, was no different. Sarah signed her name, Frank Thompson, with a firm flourish. She was now a private in Company F, 2nd Michigan Volunteer Infantry of the Army of the, Potom the Potomac. Frank could outshoot and outride many country boys and was certainly more skilled than all the city folk. She felt at home in the Army, living with a large group of men, practicing drills together, learning the discipline of a fighting force. She liked sharing a tent. Since the soldiers slept in their clothes, it didn't seem risky, but cozy. Frank loved the easy camaraderie and jokes, sharing stories and letters from back home. She didn't even mind being teased. The other soldiers laughed at her small boots and called her, Our little woman! Frank laughed louder than the rest of them at the nickname. If only they knew. For the first time in years, Frank had friends and work that really mattered. She was proud of what she was doing. First learning to be a soldier, then training as a nurse, which was something only men with the strongest stomachs did because of the long, draining hours and the horrors of surgery without anesthetic. One bloody battle followed another, sometimes the north one, sometimes the south, but always the soldiers lost, thousands of them dying or maimed. Frank fought alongside her friends in the Battle of Bull Run and the Battle of Fair Oaks. She pulled wounded men from the battlefield, racing through mine balls and shells to save as many as possible. During the Battle of Williamsburg, a fellow nurse yelled at her to help retrieve an officer who lay on the ground, groaning in pain. Frank heaved the colonel's limp body onto the cloth and grabbed the other end of the stretcher. The two nurses raced to the edge of the battlefield, where the doctors waited for the injured. Dr. Bonine, she called. Over here, this man's a colonel. 
The doctor bent over the officer's still body. Is he dead? Frank asked, sick at the thought of carrying a corpse instead of rescuing a soldier. He's breathing, but I don't know what's wrong. The doctor poked and prodded. Where are you injured, sir? I don't see any marks. Are you hurt? The question changed into a roar of accusation. You, sir, are a fraud. Get up this instant and back into battle before I report you as a deserter. Without a word, the colonel brushed himself off and strode away while Frank seethed. No coward will fool me again, she promised herself. There are too many real soldiers who need my help. One late April night, when the troops were preparing for the siege of Yorktown, Frank was making the rounds in the hospital tent when the regimental chaplain approached her. If you're willing, there's an important job I want to recommend you for. It's dangerous, but I wouldn't ask if I didn't think you could do it. More dangerous than fighting, Frank thought, but waited for the chaplain to explain. One of our best spies has been captured and killed. The chaplain pressed his long fingers together. I think you're just the man to replace him. I'd like to give your name to the generals. He paused, looking intently at Frank's young, soft face. He'd seen the boy face the ugliest wounds without flinching. He had seen him race through gunfire to rescue a wounded soldier. Still, he knew he was asking the nurse to take even greater risk as a spy. Will you do it? Frank didn't hesitate. I'm your man. For her first mission, Frank decided to disguise herself as a freed slave. She knew the white men, especially Southerners, didn't look closely at black men. Slaves were even more invisible than old, old women, people who were looked past, not at. So she darkened her skin with silver nitrate, put on a wig and torn clothes, and headed off to the rebel lines just as the day was dawning. In the darkened stillness, she crawled along the ground, stopping every time she heard a twig snap or a branch rest, rustle. When she thought she must have passed the sentries, she stood up on, a nervous, on nervous legs, looking for the tents of the Confederate camp. She soon ran into a group of slaves, bringing breakfast to the rebel pickets, the men who guarded the camp. Mind if I join you? She asked. I'm looking for work. We got work aplenty, if that's what you want. A skinny young boy offered her cornbread and coffee. Frank wolfed it down, nodding her thanks. But after she helped carry food to the pickets and followed the group back into camp, she wasn't sure what to do. The others knew exactly where to go and melted off to their assigned places. Which one should she follow? Frank wondered. Where would she learn the most? You there, boy, who do you belong to? Why are you standing there gawking? I don't belong to no man, Frank said. I'm heading to Richmond to find work. As long as there's a Confederate army, you'll belong to someone, the officer roared. There'll be no free slaves so long as our hearts beat strong, and don't you forget it. Now go work on the fortifications if you don't want a whooping. Frank gritted her teeth, but she did as she was told. Frank followed the line of sweating black workers, pushed gravel-filled wheelbarrows over a narrow plank to build up the earthworms facing the Union Army. Frank was used to hard work, but by midday, her palms were bloody and raw. She almost tipped her wheelbarrow twice. Each time, another worker rushed over to help her. For now, all she could do was nod her, nod her thanks, but she was determined that she would find a way to repay her new friends. While digging, wheeling, and heaping up gravel, Frank studied the layout of the rebel fortifications. She counted guns and noted logs and had been painted black and set up to look like cannons from a distance. When night fell and everyone else was asleep, she took took out the paper and pencil she'd hidden in her shoes and started to write what she remembered. After listing the weapons, she flipped over the paper to sketch the ramparts and mark where each gun stood. Footsteps clumped behind her, and she quickly folded the plan and stuck it back into its hiding place. The next morning, her muscles were stiff and sore, and her palms so raw she didn't see how she could manage the pickaxe. When she saw the slender boy with the friendly eyes again, this time filling buckets with water, she got an idea. You bringing water to the troops, she asked the boy. Uh-huh, he said, nodding his head. Would you mind trading jobs with me? I got no skin left on my hands. I'll give you 30 cents if you switch with me. Frank held out some coins. The boy shook his head. 
I can't use money, but I'll switch jobs, don't you worry. Frank grinned. I'll make it up to you, I promise. Frank heaved up the heavy buckets and headed for a cluster of soldiers. As she filled canteens, she was surprised to recognize a tall, lanky peddler who came to the Union camp once a week, selling newspapers and stationery for letters home. He was busy describing the layout of the Union camp and its defenses. Well, I'll be, Frank muttered, sloshing water on the spy's legs. Hey, watch there, dolt, the fake peddler yelled. Frank lowered her head. Sorry, sorry, she said, and she really was sorry. Sorry she couldn't rush back to the Union camp right then and tell the generals that what she'd learned. Frank waited until the sunset, and then she headed toward the pickets, hoping she could slip by a soldier if he nodded off or got distracted. The only thing to hide her was the darkness. She hadn't gone far, though, when a voice stopped her. You there! Frank turned to face a thick-set officer. Take this rifle and head for the picket post by the brambles. The guard was shot, so we need a replacement. The officer handed Frank a gun. And don't you even think about shutting those eyes of yours. Frank headed off, surprised that the rebel would hand a weapon to a slave. Didn't he worry about a slave revolt? Later, she learned it was Confederate policy not to arm slaves, something this particular officer didn't seem to care about, luckily for her. Frank took her post and then kept on going. Once she got close to the Union pickets, she curled up on the ground to wait until morning. As the sun rose, Frank took off her wig and waved it at the Union picket near her. Her hair felt cool and free in the morning breeze. It's Private Frank Thompson. I don't care what your name is. You ain't coming one step closer less than you get the password. The guard cocked his rifle and squinted down the barrel. Liberty Bell. Frank grinned, twirling the wig on his fingers. The guard gaped but lowered his gun. Frank must have made an odd sight, dressed in rags with darkened skin and matted hair. She took long, easy strides, tired and hungry, but feeling strangely light inside. She opened the flap of the general's tent, ready to report what she'd learned. Freedom, she knew, wasn't something to take for granted. It was something to fight for, to cherish. And so long as her heart was beating strong, that's just what she would do.